life changed for me dramatically. I remember thinking I would love to get into schools and share this with kids so that this way they understand also what I went through and how awful that path becomes. And it doesn't have to be that way. There's a totally different path over here. Which path did God call us to? Broad path or the narrow path? Narrow path. Who said it? Yeah, narrow path. I took the broad path with everyone else. Right? Because that's what the world wants you to do. The secular world that's out there wants you to take the broad path that everybody else has taken. I took it. I fell into the trap, right? It didn't work well for me. And that's the only reason. I don't want to be here. That's not what I do for a living, guys. I don't get paid, right? This is volunteer work. The only reason I'm here is to tell you guys the truth, right? Which is nice. You guys can get the truth, the facts from someone, the real truth, right? No political agenda. I don't have anything to, you know, any reason to tell you this, right? So here's one of the traps that we fell into. When you're a young guy and you find your girlfriend, right? There's pressure on you. I mean, you have your academic pressure, your athletic pressures, your extracurricular pressures. Like I said, you're applying to college, getting into a good school, major. Maybe you're not going to college. You're going to start your young adult work life, right? You got drugs and you have alcohol, right? Just a side note on that. Do you guys know what this heroin addiction looks like? If you try heroin, heroin, what's the percentage chance that you'll ever get off of it? Do you know? Yeah, the stats that I saw are literally 89% that if you try heroin, you will be addicted and never get off of it. And you know what that addiction looks like. That is overdose, right? Death, gone. We had two baseball dads in our community that OD'd in the last two years. These are just regular dads with kids, the baseball field. I didn't know they were heroin addicts, right? Gone. Clients of mine, right? That have come in where the spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend has OD'd. It's crazy. If I were you guys and I'm not here to talk to you about drugs, I would stay clear of the pills, right? And the opioids, the heroin, I would just stay completely clear, right? I'm not condoning other, you know, substances and alcohol. I'm just saying that's one thing that I wouldn't even go anywhere near, right? But one of the other pressures that you guys run into now, you know, or it'll, it'll be happening, it's coming your way quick, is, you know, you have a girl that you're with, dating or girlfriend, you know, steady girlfriend, whatever, and you have that sexual pressure too. And that's something you guys are going to face, and you have to make a decision with that one and how you want to handle it. Trish and I didn't make the right decision, guys, unfortunately. And I wish that we did, because there is a broad path and there is a narrow path, and we just follow the broad path, right? So we caved, we gave in on that one, and we gave in on that pressure. But here's how it turned out for us, and that's the important thing, is that I want you guys to know. If you have sex with, uh, with a girl, what's one of the consequences? Yeah, she winds up pregnant, right? Is that planned? No, it's unplanned. You know what society's trying to tell us right now? If you have an un, and they were trying to tell me too when I was younger, right? If you have an unplanned pregnancy, that means it's an unwanted baby, right? Is that true? Not necessarily, right? You know how I know it's not true? My brother Nick and my wife Allison weren't able to have children. Is that an unwanted baby? No, they had to adopt, right? You know how many people out there aren't able to have children but want children and have to adopt? I th started thinking about it and I looked at, at my relationship with Trisha, right? Because we fell into that trap of having sex. And I looked at that word contraception against the beginning, right? Against life. And I thought about it. You have your IUD and your condom. You know what they call those? That's the barrier method of contraception. So I'm like 25 or 26 years old. There's a lot of pressure on us. You've been together for 10 years, Pete and Tricia. When are you going to get engaged? When are you going to get married, right? So we're supposed to get married, right? And then I'm looking at it and I'm saying, 
we use contraception in our relationship, right? So think about that. Is that sex or is that love? If we use contraception in our relationship, right? Sex or love? Well, I want to make love to you, but hold on. I got to get my barrier in place first. After I get my barrier in place, then we can make love. Does that sound like love or does it just sound like sex? Sex, right? Yeah, it doesn't sound like love, right? Then I get exposed to this other way of doing it, and there's this other way of doing it that I want to talk to you guys about, and that was totally different, right? So again, I'm like 25, 26 years old, and I'm thinking about getting married to Trisha, and I don't see how it's going to work out for us because we have a really bad relationship at the time, really bad relationship, and we've done it this way. And here's what I start looking at. I start looking at divorce rates of couples. What's the divorce rate for a married couple? More. Yeah. Yep. Divorce rate for married couples. Uh, one of the students in the last class said 53%. I'm pretty sure he's accurate, right? 50%. In the early 1900s, the divorce rate for married couples was 10% approximately. By the 1950s, it had gone up to 25%. Now we have the pill becomes available, right? And the sexual revolution, and all of a sudden, in a matter of 10, 20 years, it goes from 25% to 50%, right? Because think about it, it's common sense. If I can have sex with my partner or my spouse and not get pregnant, who else can I have sex with and not get pregnant? Anyone I want, right? And the sexual revolution just told me that sex isn't about bonding with someone else, and it's certainly not about having babies, it's just about pleasure. So that's why we're going to have sex, so I can have it with my partner, and I can have it with anyone else, and now I don't have to worry about getting pregnant because I'm on the pill, right? What's cheating do for relationships? Absolutely destroys them, right? Destroys them. Take my word for it, guys. Trisha cheated on me in high school. I cheated back on her. Then I got some great idea from my brother, and he says, just always stay one up on her, dude. Keep cheating on her to make sure that, right, that you always stay ahead of the game so that doesn't happen again, right? Because he had been cheated on by a girlfriend, and that hurts when you're in love with somebody, right? And when you're having sex with someone, the danger in that is there's this bonding that occurs when you're going to that level in your relationship, guys, and you're having that intimacy and that sex, and I know Mr. Lewis talks to you about it, but there's this bonding that occurs between the two of you that's natural, that God wants you to experience. It's what makes couples share in that unity together, right? That whole two become one. When you do that, but you're doing it inappropriately, right? And the relationship isn't meant or going to last forever, and you try and break that apart, my gosh, you know what you wind up with? These like fragmented, damaged people. There's nothing wrong with my brother, right? He's a great guy. He was cheated on. He was damaged. He knows what hurt and pain felt like, right? He watched me go through it. He didn't want that to happen to us again, so he figured, I'll just do it back to the person, right? Now you have this going on amongst each other. That's part of the reason you have these crazy divorce rates. If you live together before you get married, you know what the divorce rate is? It's like two-thirds, three-quarters, right? So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, all right, I have my relationship with Trisha. I fell in love with her when we were 15 years old. I would like to marry her, but my gosh, on paper, we don't stand a chance. So Trish and I have talked about this, right? And we said, if there's two things that we could change before we got married, what are those two things? One, we wouldn't have sex before we got married. And I know what you guys are thinking. Yeah, Pete, it's a lot easier for you to say that. You know what I mean? You're 40, you're married, you get to have sex whenever you want to, right? Believe me, guys, and you'll find out why in a few minutes here. It would have saved us so much trouble, pain, and anguish along the way. Second thing that Trish and I wouldn't have done before we got married, we wouldn't have lived together. You're taking something else that's special, right? And you're trying to create it, right? And you're not fully committing to each other. You're basically saying we're going to move in together. We'll like, you know, pay bills together, eat some dinner together or whatever, but like we're not going to go the full, maybe we'll get a dog together, but we're not going to like, you know, fully commit to each other and get married. We were probably 20, 
22 or 23, 24 after college, right? You know why? Here's what I found out later on, guys. See, for me, I'm a guy, right? I want to move in with Trisha because that means we sleep in the same bed at nighttime, so what do we get to do? Have sex, right? Yeah. Trisha wants to move in together because she graduated college, she's a nurse, she's been dating the same guy for seven years, what she want? She wants marriage. You got two people living together that aren't even on the same page. They want two different things and don't even realize that they want two different things, right? Can you imagine the fighting that starts to ensue? Yeah? The arguments, the unfulfilled expectations, right? And then what happens? Then they break up, yeah? And Trish and I almost wound up like that also. Almost wound up breaking up. I'm thankful we didn't. This guy, Gosnell, right in our own city. We don't even learn about it or hear about it. Delivering babies full term, nine months, cutting their their cervical cords with scissors, right? Stuffing baby parts into toilets, blood everywhere. This went on in our own city. The police station was a block away. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. This is what we're being taught is normal. All of this, right? This Dr. Bernard Nathanson, he was the head of NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Whatever League, and he was the largest abortion doctor in the United States. He was an atheist, an atheist. So it wasn't a matter of religion, church, morality. As a, a doctor, right, and an atheist, when ultrasound became available and he had to watch an abortion on ultrasound and he saw the baby trying to retract and pull away, he realized that he was killing a living organism, so he shut the abortion facility down and made a 180. Guys, real quick before we wrap up, I just want to say that you would have think Trish and I would have gotten it together after that happened, that painful, terrible experience, but when you're having sex, you get used to it, right? and you keep doing it, right? So she got pregnant again in college. We had to go through it all over again. And this time the choice was totally taken away from me after she called her mom and dad, right? And we had to go through that horrible experience again. I'm telling you, our relationship got really, really bad and it was really damaged, you guys can imagine, right? All that hurt, all that anger. I am so thankful. I'm so thankful to God. When my brother passed away, I went on retreat and I went to confession for the first time in 10 years. You know when they make you go, right? Here, senior year of high school. And I confessed everything. And from that point on, it was such a gift and such a blessing. It was almost like God said to me, you've been over here doing your own thing for these last 10 years. Thanks for coming back to me. And you know what he gave us? I went home. And I said, Trisha, you got to stop taking the pill. I love you. I'm not willing to risk your health on that, right? That's what real love sounds like, guys. When you tell your girlfriend you love her so much, she's not replaceable. You're not willing to risk her. And she winds up pregnant a month later. Our oldest son, Pete, who's here in the seventh grade, was born on my brother's birthday, the one who had just passed from cancer. If my brother doesn't die and I don't go back to God and I don't go to retreat and go to confession and learn about the pill and all that, she never winds up pregnant. We probably don't have our six amazing, beautiful babies. So once again, just wrapping up, I tried it one way, guys. I tried it this other way. So much better this way. And I hope that you guys remember that as you guys are moving on, you know, with your adult lives, right? Thanks so much. I'm so happy I was able to be here with you.